Irit, who came in last uh, year, but those guys at the front were unfortunate to, to miss out on one of his assemblies. So this morning he will be talking to us um, about Black History Month, and hopefully all of you um, are aware that October celebrates Black History Month. So I will hand over to Elliot now, and uh, please listen intently. Thank you. Thank you. How's everyone doing today? Good. All good? All right. Well, it's lovely to meet you new guys who I've not met before, and it's good to see you all again who I've met previously. So, let's check this is recording all right. Yeah, good to go. Okay, so, today we're going to be talking about black history. Why black history? Now, what is often a common misconception about Black History Month is it was something that was persuaded for people to look into and persuaded for people to study. Well, in that matter of fact, it started off in the 1920s, in America and then later on in the UK has mainly an internal um, point of discussion and point of study amongst the black community. Why? Because history is important. History educates us on what we're capable of. It allows us to look into the past for role models and for examples of great individuals and also examples of what we can learn from. And these individuals often find themselves throughout our common culture. For example, there's a reason why British people revere Winston Churchill. I mean, put your hands up if you were to say that Winston Churchill was a pretty uh, ex extraordinary Briton. Amazing. Now, if I was to ask you why, apart from winning World War II, what would you say? Yeah? And he had great leadership skills. Great leadership skills. In what, can you give me an example of that? Yeah, helped inspire the people, fantastic. Any other reasons? Right, so we can see how, and this is the point I wanted to make, about 50 to 60% to of everyone put their hands up, and then we have one individual who was able to put forth a logical reason as to why Winston Churchill is revered, right? Now, the reason why is that Winston Churchill has been incorporated into British culture as an ideal, as someone who is an ideal for leadership, even though we don't have logical reasons to back up necessarily why he is, he's still an example of a British ideal. Now, this is a form of deification, or a way that individuals, because of their esteem and because of their accomplishments, then become part of the, norm, of the cultural norm. And this is more to give evidence to how important history is. Individuals who have done great things become part of the common consciousness. And this is why black history was endeavoured to be studied in the 1920s in America and then later on in the UK. Now, my work, you'll see a couple of examples there, is I teach black history, but then as well as this, I'm working on a comic book universe to bring black history his, uh, black historical heroes to life through comic books and to make sure that every person can benefit from the great individuals that have come before us. Now, today, slightly different to before, we're going to be focused on focusing on the life of one individual rather than multiple individuals, which we did before. And this individual, I would argue, is one of the greatest people to have ever lived. His name is Toussaint Louverture. Put your hands up if you've heard of Toussaint Louverture before. Got, got a few. Okay, very good. Put your hands up if you've heard of the Haitian Revolution. Okay, got a few. Now, this is the only example in the history, in, in written history, where an enslaved population has overthrown their oppressor and set, a dem set up a democracy in its place. But it is not just this feat. It is the way that it was accomplished, which is extraordinarily special. We have a man Toussaint Louverture who led not just with genius but also with very strong principles and ethics. Now the story that I'm going to tell you has almost biblical proportion. It could be written into a Hollywood film very very easily. Now what we're going to do is take it through step by step and then after that we're going to assess the character of Toussaint Louverture for his flaws and for his, uh, his uh, attributes, and then after that we can enter a discussion and we'll go through some questions and answers, all right? So the, <coughs> the lesson objectives for today is to explore the importance of role models, see why it is useful to look back in history at individuals who we revere and study them so that we can hopefully internalise some of their quality traits. We're going to explore the life of Toussaint Louverture, and most importantly, we're going to try and extract as much meaning as possible from the life of Toussaint Louverture. So, our story begins in 1791 in Haiti. 
Now, we need to put a little bit of uh, perspective in this and add a little bit of context to it. 1791. Now, since around 1492, the Western European forces, mainly France, Spain, um, France, Spain, and uh, Portugal, and Great Britain, had started to carve up pieces of the so-called New World, what we now call today America. However, because they genocided much of the native population and they had all this land that needed to be worked, they then looked to a reliable and sturdy workforce to work this land. And that's when they started to go to West Africa and they started to, you could say, kidnap and also manipulate the internal uh, battles and conflicts between the tri of the tribes of West Africa and start to extract individuals from those populations. The average age of the individual who was then taken to the Americas was 15. Their life expectancy after arriving in the Americas was seven years because they were worked so hard. The, to put it into perspective, in Jamaica, at the end of, uh, well, during emancipation, or at the end of emancipation, the population was 300,000 individuals. It should have been closer to about 1.5 million individuals, but it was because they were worked so hard that it kept the population down, and then they needed to take more Africans from the west coast of Africa to uh, restock their own slave population. So we can see quite easily here how tension had re reached boiling point in Haiti at this time, which was a French slave colony. Haiti was the jewel of the French empire. It was a source of huge wealth and therefore huge amounts of hedonism. People um, enjoying a lot of pleasure from spending their money in the most heinous ways imaginable. Now, at the same time, we also had some bubbling uh, conflict within France. We had the French Revolution, where the working class individuals, or the peasant class, were starting to rile up against the monarchy. And the African Haitians were, were in the loop. They knew about this. They knew that there were bubbling tensions around the hierarchy at this time in France. And they looked to do the same thing in Haiti. They wanted to take down the power structure in Haiti. Now this brings us to the Bois Cayman ceremony. This is where the daughter of an Italian prince and an enslaved African woman called Cecile Fatima allied with a man called Dutty Bookman, who was originally a Gambian Islamic scholar who was kidnapped from Africa, taken to Jamaica, and then from Jamaica sold to Haiti. Bookman means bookman. Uh, the reason why he was called Bookman is because he was a very well-educated scholar. He could read and write multiple languages, and he was very influenced. Uh, he was very influential in the Haitian Revolution. So during the Bois Cayman ceremony, they sacrificed a pig. Dutty Bookman read out a prayer, and Cecile, uh, Cecile Fatima, who was a Voudon priestess, told the prophecy of a black Messiah that a black man was going to rise up from Haiti and was going to rescue the African Haitians from the chains of slavery. Shortly after that, we had a fairly disorganised uproar amongst the enslaved population. What was rumoured at the time is that a man called Toussaint Louverture was actually, in, was actually present at the Bois Cayman ceremony and he was listening to the words of Cecile Fatima. Now, Toussaint Louverture, already a very impressive man, born into slavery, the son of an African king, by the age of 30, he'd worked his way up and he'd bought his own freedom. By the age of 50, and this is quite interesting, he didn't only have multiple businesses, but he was actually a slave owner. And this is important because then we start to draw up the, the conflicts in history and see that history isn't actually that clean cut. There are some huge discrepancies. But what matters is, what I would argue matters, is whether or not Toussaint Louverture was on the right side of history by the time that he passed. So he bought freedom by the age of 30, by 50 on multiple businesses. He was trilingual, spoke multiple languages, and he was very wealthy. However, by 50, he abandoned his business. He, he liquidated some of his assets, and he started to take leadership in the Haitian Revolution. Now, just what's quite interesting about Toussaint Louverture is that he was born on the Breda Plantation in Haiti. He endured the severe brutality of slavery. However, at the time of the Haitian Revolution, at the time that he erupted, he escorted his previous slave master off of his property to safety. This is something which is quite interesting in the ethical and the moral traits of Toussaint Louverture, which we'll explore later. 
What is also quite interesting is amongst this chaos, Toussaint Louverture realised that he needed to see order. He needed to find order. Now, whilst everyone was erupting and burning plantations and doing their own thing, Toussaint Louverture decided to make allyship or to, to an allegiance with three trusted men. Dutty Bookman, who we've spoken about before, Jean-Francois and Georges Biasot. 30% of the recruits in the Haitian Revolution were women. Now, what Toussaint Louverture needed to exercise was extreme genius, extreme intelligence, but also very refined strategy. He was up against the odds. This is a group of individuals who released themselves from slavery, who are now up against one of the superpowers of the world, France. What Toussaint Louverture did is he avoided spilling the blood of his own men at all costs. He knew that the powers, the French the Spanish and the British wanted Haiti because it was so wealthy. And he decided to fight them off against each other. So what did he do? He used his, his ability to write, he used his ability to speak multiple different languages and his allegiances to start to write to the Spanish. Now remember that Haiti was under French control at this time. He started to write to the Spanish to say that if you start to give us guns and if you start to give us armory and, and, and supplies, then we'll fight the French for you, on your behalf. How does that sound? And the Spanish obliged and said, yep, that sounds like a good idea. He used advanced uh, hit and run tactics. At this point in time, we were still during the phase of uh, uh, imperial military tactics. People marching in formation, people lining up in a straight line. The Maroons in Haiti and Jamaica at that time actually used West African battle tactics which is that a, a, a form of skirmishing. You hit and run. You run amongst, uh, amongst the trees, you zigzag, you hit them, and then you duck back into the forest. These are called guerrilla tactics, right? At the time, the, the time that um, they were using these tactics, the British specifically were so scared of having their throats slit in the night that they barely slept when they later invaded Haiti. Now, the... British, so after, um, after, after Toussaint Louverture had successfully led the Haitian revolutionaries to defeat the French with the, with the Spanish, he then later um, had to deal with the invasion of the British, who during the British-French wars, wanted to, Britain wanted to take over Haiti because it was such a wealthy um, source, of, because it was such a huge source of income. This is during the times of 1793 to 1798. Now, in 1798, uh, Toussaint Louverture concluded an armistice with the now exhausted British, who agreed to evacuate all their positions on the colony. They had lost 15,000 men, spending over £10 million to retain their position. And he later routed them again with, uh, with the use of disease. So essentially, what happened is this. So we have Toussaint Louverture. He turned his back on the French, allied with the Spanish. He then turned his back on the Spanish to ally with the French. The British then invaded Haiti to try and take Haiti from the French. Toussaint Louverture used guerrilla tactics again, and then once he had exhausted a lot of his resources, he led the British up through the mountains, knowing that they were going to die of the diseases in, in Haiti, and that decimated their forces. However, later after that, the French then invaded. But at this point in time, Toussaint Louverture had grand ideas. He wasn't just looking at freeing the the African Haitians, he was looking to freeing the Jamaicans, he was looking to helping the African Americans to fight for freedom, and then also was looking to abolish slavery in West Africa. This is a man of grand, grand ideas. <coughs> now, after the French Revolution, and the French Revolution was very much about liberty for all, once again because of the chaos that ensued after the French Revolution, Order ensued when Napoleon Bonaparte rose to first consul after a is a coup d'état. Yeah, after a coup d'état. Napoleon Bonaparte wanted to seize back Haiti, who had freed themselves from slavery, so he could start to gain the wealth which had been lost, regain the wealth which had been lost. The French at this time recruited a friend of Napoleon of of, of uh, Toussaint Louverture named uh, Baptiste to rendezvous with Toussaint Louverture. Shortly after their rendezvous, Toussaint Louverture was kidnapped. He was taken from Haiti to, uh, to France, and he was then escorted 
um, and imprisoned in eastern France, where he later died. Shortly after this, one of Toussaint Louverture's generals rose through the ranks, his name is Jean-Jacques Dessalines, and he killed every French person on the island in retaliation. Now, you see the contrast between, say, the character of Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint Louverture. Toussaint Louverture was looking to ally with the French, eventually, he was working, looking to work with the French and the Western European forces, eventually. The reason why is you cannot exist on an island without trade. You cannot exist without allegiance. He knew that he was going to have to put aside some of his personal uh, vendettas with the French and wanted to become part of something greater for the good of Haiti. We've got Jean-Jacques Dessalines, however, who you might argue was uh, more aggressive in his manner and more extreme in his manner as to what he wanted to do and what he saw for the future of Haiti. So Jean-Jacques Dessalines later destroys the French army. Bonaparte, who was later taken to St. Helena after he was defeated by the British, admits his mistakes for underestimating Toussaint Louverture. He states that, if I just go back, yeah, so Napoleon Bonaparte blamed the Council of State, his wife Josephine, and the shrieks of the colonial lobby for poisoning his relationships with Toussaint. So these is, is, it's rumoured to be one of his dying words that I should not have underestimated Toussaint Louverture. In 1803, after being imprisoned in eastern France, Napoleon, um, uh, uh, after being imprisoned in eastern France, Toussaint Louverture later dies of pneumonia. And what's quite interesting about this picture, if you see the picture on the right hand side, it says quite a lot about how the artist viewed Toussaint Louverture. Now this, um, the vapor look in his face and the way that light is shining on him from the window, it Rings true, you see this a lot in, in pictures of uh, messiahs or prophets, them being blessed with light. It was very much thought of Toussaint Louverture being a gift from God in Haiti. He was actually given a medal uh, which said, first God, then him, i.e. after God there is Toussaint Louverture. He's massively revered. He used uh, a lot of symbolism to capture the ideas of the African Haitians, which we'll later look into. He was a, a very, very, very intelligent man. We've got there uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, who was obviously Toussaint Louverture's enemy, and he, as he was banished by the British to the island of St. Helena on the left-hand side. Now, after this, after Toussaint Louverture had defeated uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, and uh, before, so after Jean-Jacques Dessalines had defeated Napoleon Bonaparte, he tried to reinvade after the capture of Toussaint Louverture. Napoleon Bonaparte wrote a letter to the Haitians and said that if you do not pay us reparations for the loss of our property, i.e. if you do not pay us for freeing yourselves, we are going to invade in full force. Haiti, because of the risk of being recaptured and being uh, resent back into slavery, felt they had to abide and they started to pay the reparations. Now, because Idrinus is in 1803, Haiti didn't stop paying those reparations until 1947. So if you think of all of the progress that a lot of Western Europe has made from the time of 1803 to 1947, Haiti's progress was hindered massively by having to pay back these reparations. Now, I've summarised the life of a very, very important individual in about 15 minutes. What we're going to now look at is his virtuous characteristics, but also is that maybe his flaws. Do you have any questions so far? All good? Okay, very good. So, like I said, the importance of these individuals that we look through history, the importance of these role models is that we can start to encompass a lot of their virtuous traits unto ourselves if we learn about them. One of, uh, so let's look at the principles of Toussaint Louverture. One of his quotes was, it is best that I suffer, but continue to do good things. Now, this is partly down to his Catholic faith, but also down to his Stoic philosophy. He was a reader of Epictetus. Epictetus? I think Epictetus. And Stoic philosophy. 
Stoic philosophy essentially teaches us that we don't have full control over the environment or of what we're experiencing, but we are in control of our attitude towards it. That then went later on to become, uh, to become incorporated into cognitive behavioral therapy. And he practiced Stoic philosophy. Toussaint Louverture also practiced to have higher ethical standards than his, than his oppressors. Marcus Aurelius, another Stoic philosopher, said the best revenge is to be unlike the individual who did you injury. That's why Toussaint Louverture and his army, if they came across French or other European individuals trying to flee from the war zones, considering that a lot of these individuals were slave owners, Toussaint Louverture would order his men to peacefully escort these men, women and children out of the war zone so they could be evacuated to America or France. Sacrifice was one of his principles. This is a, an extract from the book Black Spartacus, he, which is based on Toussaint Louverture. It's a biography of, uh, of Toussaint Louverture. He slept only a few hours every night, drank no alcohol, and his capacity for physical endurance was greater than even the hardiest of his men. His daily diet consisted of a modest plate of vegetables served with a few pieces of chicken or salted beef. When meat was not available, eggs or cheese. He would ride 130 miles a day in front of his army engage, and engaged in combat at times for 15 days straight. The reason why he rode in front of his army was to protect them. He was acting as a general and a scout, leading by example. He often rode through the nights while suffering from fever. He marched his troops 75 miles per day, often outperforming enemy cavalry units. Strength in leadership, another quote. I am the person that black people see when they look in the mirror. And is it important to me that they must turn, uh, that they, they must turn if they wish to enjoy the fruits of liberty? Once again, we spoke about the use of symbolism. Toussaint Louverture, remember these are individuals of African descent. Toussaint Louverture himself was the son of a king. He would use, uh, you see on his hat, you see the feather on his hat? So that's a Voudon uh, symbol. He also used a red handkerchief, which he would tie up and place on his head to, symbol, to symbolise the Yoruba god Ogon, the, and the, who was a, a god of black, uh, black, uh, blacksmith. He was a blacksmith god, featuring in Yoruba religion. He, or Yoruba theology, yeah, Yoruba religion. He also led by example. He was seriously wounded in battle 17 times. His teeth were dislodged, his hand was broken, and he carried on fighting. He instilled courage in his own men. There's a time where, because of a lack of resources, when his men went to storm a fort, the men realised that they didn't have enough ladders to get up to the top of the fort. Toussaint Louverture and the other generals ordered his men to stand on top of each other's shoulders. And after a long time of standing on top of each other's shoulders and, and having to, to take cover from, gun, from gunfire, they eventually made it over the top of the, fort, of the fortress and they won, they won the battle. So this is a quote, once again, um, from the book Black Spartans. In 1798, when Toussaint Louverture stormed the British position of Fort Churchill with his elite troops, his men realised that their ladders were too short, so they stood on one another's shoulders for half an hour, taking heavy casualties, but eventually succeeding in creating a breach in the enemy position. And also, when it comes to leadership, strategy. Enemy soldiers were scared of sleeping, scared of sleeping because they had, because of our fear of having their throat slit. This is something that he purposefully did. He purposefully instilled fear in the enemy to gain the advantage. He used maroon tactics of large drums going into battle, screams, making loud noises to scare the enemies, causing the British on multiple occasions to flee. And then the last one that we need to look at is infrastructure and education. There's no point in fighting for a revolution if you've raised the country in the process. We see this during, during World War II, for example, where very little progress was made. Huge reinvestment had to be put back into infrastructure after. Toussaint Louverture decided to invest in infrastructure during the Haitian Revolution. A quote for himself was, avoid sloth, the mother of all vices. He hated laziness. So, as soon as the Haitian Revolution started, coming back to education, Toussaint Louverture started to aggressively learn about military tactics. He had to play catch up. He wrote and spoke three languages. He even wooed the wives of the aristocrats in France to try and get on their better sides. He spoke truth to power. Speaking truth to power means that no matter your position, you speak the truth to those who are in power and you speak it until they hear what you're saying. 
He said, even though I am just a black man, and even though I have not received as polished an education as you or your officers, I would feel that, I would feel that such dishonourable acts, were they committed by my forces, would tarnish my nation's glory. A man of high, high ethical standards. He invested once again in regeneration. He rebuilt towns that were affected by war. He built schools in Haiti. So during that, it was illegal for slaves to have an education. To have an education. Shortly after he freed them, he was now trying his best to educate them. Every single town had a, had a headmaster who would be responsible for bringing up the literacy rates of the children and, and the adults in the area. He pulled talent from all races. There are significant populations of uh, Europeans in Haiti, and there were at that time. A lot of the Europeans defected onto the side of the Haitian revolutionaries, and he absorbed all of their talents into his revolutionary forces. He even wrote principles on how to repair broken marriages. Of this very stressful time, a lot of people are losing their husbands and wives, and he tried to create an infrastructure to enable individuals to reclaim married life short, um, after, after the Haitian Revolution. Now, when it comes to Toussaint Louverture's legacy, these are a few key points that I would like to highlight to you. First one, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. This is a phrase that I quite like. Often, throughout our lives, we are drawn to uh, socialise with individuals for multiple different reasons. But the individuals that we socialise with shape us as individuals. Toussaint Louverture was very, very careful as to who he surrounded himself with to make sure that he got the best out of himself and best out of the movement that he was, that he was, uh, he was, in, that he was inspiring. <coughs> <coughs> he also inspired people beyond his fear. Beyond his, his fear. Toussaint Louverture inspired people, not just of those in living memory, but those Without, uh, who were not within his living memory, and also those who were situated around the Caribbean at the time. In 1799, um, Africans who were situated on, on, in Jamaica were saying, black, white, or brown, we are all the, all the same. And this was partly taken from the philosophy of Toussaint Louverture at the time. He inspired the, world, he inspired the working class worldwide, including in Britain. He inspired Marcus Garvey, Nat Turner, Samuel Sharp, Frederick Douglass. He, the, the Haitian Revolution scared the Western, colonial, the Western European colonial forces so much that it started to cause a domino effect of slave rebellion. So it inspired the Africans and, and instilled so much fear in the Western Europeans that within 30 years we had the emancipation of slavery amongst the, in, within the West Indies. Now considering that this is at a time where during the emancipation of slavery in Jamaica, which was a British colony, 75% of British MPs owned plantations in Jamaica, who had in invested in plantations in the West Indies. This is something that, did not, that they did not want to end. However, individuals like Toussaint Louverture forced their hand. He gave them ultimatum. If you give us our freedom, or we're going to take it back ourselves. But what I find quite interesting about the Haitian Revolution, about Toussaint Louverture himself, is that he offers a microcosm of not just a, a fantastic individual and not just humanity in, in his individual state, but humanity in general. It shows that not everyone is perfect. Like I said, he used to own slaves, and then he freed his slaves to then fight in the Haitian Revolution. He's my hero, but he might not necessarily be another person's hero. And this then brings up the conversation about cancel culture. Can we cancel someone just because they don't fit everyone's ideal? I mentioned Winston Churchill earlier. Winston Churchill was partly, quite considerably responsible for the, for the famine which killed five million Bengalis, and later uh, uh, another, uh, you could call it genocide, which killed multiple, what, hundreds of thousands, not millions of Kenyans. Yet to some individuals, Winston Churchill might be a hero, and that's absolutely fine. You can deify who you want, but what's also quite important is that we look to the individual and we try and critique them so we can make sure that we take the best parts and, I, and understand their worst parts as well. One other principle, which I, and one other form of his legacy which, which touches me is, is, to, is to know yourself. Toussaint Louverture took great pride in his African heritage and the fact that he descended from an African king. And the sum, to summarise, or one other case that I would like to make 
is that although Toussaint Louverture is a spectacular individual, he is still human, and we are all human, and it takes one to know one. I hope that you enjoyed uh, today's presentation. I hope that it gave you some insight into black history and to, into some form of black history, which has connections to pre-colonial and post-colonial black history. And uh, yeah, if you wanted to find out any more about what I do, then we need to go to his blackhistory.school or just find me on Instagram, Elliot Reed, Elliot John Reed. And uh, yeah, if you don't have any questions now, that's fine, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions later. But if you have any questions, then please knock yourself out and, and ask away. Okay, so we, we'll spend a little bit more time in here if anybody does have any questions, uh, whether it's about historical black history or whether it's something maybe modern day, current. I know that a lot of you would have seen things in the news or on social media in the last two, three, four years um, that you may have questions about. So um, yeah, please do feel that this is an opportunity to ask those questions. Um, and like Elliot said, if, if you don't have any questions right now, perhaps um, you can put them to myself um, or your form tutors, and we can get answers for those at a, at a later date. But does anybody have any questions about perhaps anything they've seen? Yes, all right. Come. A bit louder. Can't hear you. Do you is it? Did you do you sell the comics anywhere? Yes. Not, not yet. So they're currently um, they're currently in prototype stage. So what I'm currently doing is um, I've got a, a concept. And I'm going to use that concept to then um, advertise, to raise money, and to to, um, get, and to to ascertain how many people are interested. And then after that, then I'll start to provide them online, uh, online to read. Thank you, Sarai. Any any more questions? Very quiet this morning. Last year we had a few questions. Any questions? Yeah, go on, Miss Rana. Um, there's a lot of um, things in like the media, and I know a lot of um, like hip hop and R&B. They're using they use that term the N word yeah. a lot. I just wanted to I think a lot of people are curious about why, you know, that word isn't appropriate to use. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a quite a complex question. Um, so First things, we need to kind of shed some, some light, right? So just like a, a British person is will have differences to a Polish person or a Russian person or a French person, we from the black community are not all the same. My family are from Jamaica. I'm sure that a lot of your families are from um, other areas of the Caribbean or, or West Africa or, or broader Africa. And um, this means that we can't then look to one small population of the diaspora and say that they represent everyone, right? Now, what is, what is quite true is that language can carry on throughout time and a lot of the time it can lose its meaning altogether or, or change its meaning, right? But a lot of the time it keeps its meaning as well. So for example, in Jamaica, um, Jamaica, the, the, the N word was quite widely used in Jamaica and it's not used at all today. In fact, if if someone was to use the N-word to me, some sort of fist up and, and say, you sure you want to continue using that word, right? But there are other words in Jamaica which do continue to be used. For example, boss or massa sometimes uh, as a form of respect. Now, what we have in America is that the N-word was kept amongst the black community, mainly. For example, previous to, say, um, NWA, so previous to the 1980s, before, the, before hip hop came quite a, a big cultural force, you wouldn't really hear it in mainstream media. And that's because, I suppose, it wasn't deemed as appropriate, uh, and it was deemed as obviously quite racist in certain contexts. But later down the line, because hip hop started to become quite common and quite popular, it started to be used more commonly. Now, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of British people are in the wrong to think that because it is used amongst a certain small number of individuals of African descent, that it's all right to use here. In my opinion, I don't like anyone using it around me, white or black, and I'll correct them if they do use it around me. And that's because my historical uh, understanding and, and my cultural understanding is completely different to the world. Of, of, of my, it's completely different to the world. For example, I, I, my, uh, there's a, I've got a few, quite, obviously quite a few family names that are still in circulation in Jamaica. One is Simpson, Pierce, Rochester. 
Um, and I went to Jamaica two years ago now, two, three years ago. And I went to a place called Sam Sharp Square. Now, Sam Sharp was a Baptist preacher. He led 60,000 Africans against the British. And in Sam Sharp Square, Montego Bay, there's a monument to everyone who served, or a lot of the generals who served, a lot of the, the key individuals who served in that revolution. And I put quite a few family names on there. And next to their family name, next, next to their names, are their punishments. 500 lashes to the back. Now, five, excuse me, 500 lashes to the back. Death, life of transportation, life of enslavement, right? Now, let's just think about 500 lashes to the back. Even if each lash took five seconds, that's 2,500 seconds. What's that, 40 minutes? That's 40 minutes of having your back with. Now, I'll tell you this. They didn't just use a whip in Jamaica. They used a cat of nine tails. Cat of nine tails is a whip that's attached to nine other whips. So it, it, will basically, it will turn you back into a bloody sponge, right? I know that my family members experience being called the N-word day in, day out, their entire life, probably for the brief seven years on average that they were actually kept alive in Jamaica until they were worked to death. That is my context of the word. Do you think I'm ever going to use that word as a form of endearment or friendship? Hell no. Definitely not. It's not happening. I can think of a hundred better words to show uh, my appreciation appreciation for someone than the N-word. I don't care how trendy people think it is, if people use that word around me, they're gonna have a lot to answer to. And that's probably, I'm probably shit, like, I'm not the minority here. If you speak to the majority of black people in the UK, they will say the same thing. It's individuals who take, who think they take more heritage from the music they listen to than what their family have actually been through, what history books, that would differ. I would say they're less educated on the matter than me. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Any more questions from, from you guys? Who's that at the back there? Tammy. A bit louder, Tammy, sorry. What are your thoughts on feelings about box phrases like Sorry, I didn't hear that last bit, so... I know you're louder than that, Tammy, go on. What are your opinions on like, box phrases like Shakey's more about like, black people? Ah, like, uh, yeah, so you talk about cultural appropriation. Yeah, um... It's interesting, isn't it? <coughs> the reason why... It, yeah. Okay, I'm going to think about this before I speak, so. Yeah, okay. Hair, especially in the black community, is quite an interesting topic. But I don't know if you know about it, but it has multiple different uses and meanings, right? Not just for protection, so like braids could, or dreads, you might argue, it's like a protective hairstyle, protects the hair whilst it grows. But also, as well as that, it was used as a form of identity in West Africa, so you could, uh, it was almost like a signature. Um, also, in um, the colonies, it also had code for, um, to, that would educate enslaved Africans on how to escape, and they would hide it in, in code in their hair that they could, they could read, right? So we have a huge, just in something as simple as hair, for the black community, we've got huge meaning from it, right? However, I think the issue is that, and I, I saw a, a video on this the other day, which I thought was quite interesting, is that there seems to be a lot of leverage behind looking a bit, I don't know, racially ambiguous or being able to pick up little traits from different races. For example, I could be born into whatever you know race I want, but I'm going to make my lips a bit bigger, make my bum a little bit bigger. I'm going to braid my hair, I'm going to tan my skin, I'm going to do all these things, right? And this is all good for the individual, as long as it's working for them. As soon as they get stopped by the police, they'll change their attitude in an instant. As soon as they feel like they need to, as long as they need to go for a job interview and they think it would be advantageous to then take out their braids and, and paint up their skin and have their hair straight or not have you know, any of these enhancements, they'll take it out in an instant. So essentially what we have here is people who are have the privilege of cherry-picking what they want from different races and different identities. But then they have the luxury of dropping it as soon as it doesn't work for them. So I would say that people are free to do what they want. I'm not going to put a, uh, I, don't, I don't think this is within my power, or I don't think I'd want to uh, ban people from doing what they want to do. Everyone's an individual. As long as they're not hurting anyone, fine. But I think that by discussing that topic, there's a lot of deeper meaning 
And I think that if people were better educated on that meaning, that they would hopefully think twice about doing it. The other thing is, when it comes to the black community, because we have been um, historically over the past five, six hundred years been colonised, we, we speak the same language as our colonisers, we worship the same gods as our colonisers. Now this means that we now no longer have a natural uh, cultural divide or break between what we do and whether other people want to interact and, and copy, right? And that in itself proposes issues, because when it comes to other communities, they, 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 they might speak a different language, they might worship a different god, they might socialise in different circles. So it's, it's a lot harder for people to kind of dip in and take out of their community. Um, so yeah, just to summarise, I wouldn't, I, th that's what I think. I think that people should be respectful, I think people should be educated on what they're doing. But at the same time, I'm quite stoic in the matter and understand that I don't have control over what uh, people do. And uh, I also think that it's important for us within the black community to, to dive down and educate ourselves on the reasons why we do what we do. Um, just as much, if not more so, looking at the reasons why people do what they do. Thank you very much. Good questions, Hammy. Thank you. I think we'll have to stop it then um, to head towards period one. But if any of you do have any further questions, um, please either stick around, okay, just for five minutes at the end to speak to Elia uh, individually, or, as I said, pass questions on to me or form tutors and we will get those um, answers back to you. But can we have one last round of applause for Elia? <laughs> I think one of the key um, learnings from that assembly actually is to educate yourselves. Okay? I think a lot of us take for granted what we read on social media, perhaps uh, that just touches the surface of, a, of an issue or a topic, and then we don't actually go away and educate ourselves um, as a community so that we understand it better. So uh, please do continue to educate yourself. But as Elliot said, lots of history. Okay? Lots of history that perhaps we didn't know, or certainly by the show of hands at the start, we didn't know. Um, that perhaps we could take a bit more of an interest in as well. We will head to period one. We're a little bit over, okay, so we've got about 20 minutes left of period one. So um, as you head towards your lesson, please do make it quick. I'll have year 11s doing the chairs at the end. So year 10s, you may stand yourselves up and head.